Good morning, good morning. Go and look at somebody on your right or your left. Just say, I'm glad you made it today. Go and tell them. Man, look around. Man, it's so good to see you. If this is your first time ever being at First Baptist Simpson Upstate Church, let me just say, welcome home. My name's Wayne. I'm one of the pastors, and we're just thrilled out of all the places you could be that you're here today. And those who are online, those who are over even overflow uh, this morning, we're so glad everybody's worshiping with us. Go and take your Bibles, turn in, turn on your Bibles to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 19 is where we're going to land in just a moment while you're turning. Let me just give you some good news. Yesterday, Egg Venture, every uh, year right before Resurrection Sunday, we have a big community event, arguably the biggest community outreach that we have as far as just connecting with the community. Um, and we had uh, weather problems Friday night, a lot of rain. So we had to change the time and we were a little concerned. I'll be honest, driving up to the park yesterday, I told Amy, I was like, maybe like 200 people, you know? Just because you change the time like that, move it from morning to afternoon, I had no idea. Yesterday, not only were over 200 folks there volunteering, you guys are amazing, but would you believe, in addition, we had the largest attendance ever at Egg Venture. So over 3,700 people showed up to the, to the park. That's great, man. The vast majority of those folks are not you. I mean, they're unchurched or people who are, you know, in the community just moved in. They're disconnected from upstate church. So that's a huge opportunity. And so we're grateful. A thousand of those people actually chose to go to the baseball field where we shared the gospel. So if, if you have never been, you'd have to know it's laid out kind of interesting. So uh, a thousand of the 3,700 went, heard the gospel. And, uh, and so the way that we present, it's not a, a pressure cooker, you know, uh, pressure decision, um, but they hear the gospel. They're invited to Resurrection Sunday at all of our campuses next week. Some of you are probably here today because you came to Egg Venture and you're like, hey, I'll go check out the church. So glad you're here, man. So awesome awesome to have you. But next Sunday, a lot of those people will probably be there. But out of the thousand people who heard the gospel, check this out, most important statistic, five of those people prayed for the first time, asked Christ to save them yesterday. So that's pretty awesome. So we praise God for that. So Revelation chapter 19, this is the second from the last message. I can't believe it, man. And I wish that we could have even gone a little slower. Maybe next time in a few years, we'll go a little slower uh, through it because it seems that though we started the first Sunday in January, we're about to be finished. We will finish the book of Revelation on Easter Sunday. I think today will help you understand why ending it on Easter makes a whole lot of sense. Today, Palm Sunday, it kind of represents, commemorates the events of Jesus found in John 12, 12. In John chapter 12, Jesus rode into Jerusalem. If you remember the story, they laid palm branches on the path as he went down the Mount of Olives. Some of you guys have actually been there with me, walking down that path. And, and so there, the people laid out palm branches while um, while Jesus rode in on a donkey, of all, all things, Jesus rode in Jerusalem on a donkey and, uh, and, and everybody was singing, Hosanna, this is the king of uh, Israel. And so Hosanna literally is deliver us. That's what the, the word means, uh, save us. And so they were crying out to the king who was entering Jerusalem on a donkey. Now, why in the world was he riding a donkey? Well, the donkey actually symbolized he wasn't riding as a conquering king. He was riding in full of peace. He was a king of peace who was coming to actually bring his kingdom and establish his kingdom first in peace by salvation. And so here's the great news, man. I'm, I'm really praying about preaching this even from a different pet place in the third service. God, I feel like has specifically some people in here today who I believe need to be saved. I really believe that. I want you to hear this. He came for you. He came for you. So the first time he came, he came for me and you. He came riding in as the conquer, I mean, as the uh, peaceful king, bringing salvation. This is the triumphal entry. What I've really never thought about, though, is that Revelation 19 is the second triumphal entry. And so this John 12 picture that we celebrate on Palm Sunday, this is the day we celebrate John 12, 12. This triumphal entry, this entering of Jerusalem of the king of peace, 
Um, and, and Revelation 19, it's another picture of Jesus um, coming in the second triumphal entry. And so we, we understand when we read Revelation 19 in just a moment, that while he first came in peace, the second time he's coming, he's not coming in the same way he came the first. So although he came for us the first time, I want you to hear this, he's coming for us a second time. But where you're at and what you've done with what he came for the first time will determine what happens to you when he comes the second time. So he came bringing peace, I want you to hear this, to every man, woman, boy, and girl on the planet. He came and brought salvation and made it available to you. And so here's the thing, at the end of the day, if we reject his free gift of salvation and grace, then we are positioning ourselves with the enemy of God and will face the consequences of our rejection of his peace, his salvation. And we will be the recipient of something that's entirely different. And so as the people cried out this first time, deliver us, save us, that really should be your heart's cry today. And I don't want you to hear anything that I'm gonna say today as, as being a motivation of fear mongering, of trying to, to, to cause you to, 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 uh, to, to go home crying. And, and I, I don't want you to think uh, in any way that, uh, especially today, if you're like, is this the way it is every day? I'm telling you, this is gonna be tough. This is a hard word to hear if you're not a believer. If you're not a Christian and you're just playing church, you're just like showing up, you're like, maybe I need to be there because I want to be a good person, but you've never cried out to God and, and become a follower of Jesus, you're not like a Christian. You're not like, you're not like confident where you're gonna spend eternity. If, the, if today was the day, you just don't know where you would spend eternity. This is going to be an uncomfortable 30 minutes for you. Because we're, and you, if you're like, well, I just don't know why you're preaching so hard. Wait, wait, listen, I'm just gonna read the Bible. And it's pretty confrontational. Revelation 19, look at verse 11. This is the second triumphal entry of Jesus, the king, who's not just a peaceful king, but this time we see he's a conquering king. Revelation 19, 11, then I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. The one sitting on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. So he rode a donkey the first time, brought peace. Second time, he's riding a white horse and he is bringing war. His eyes are like a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems, crowns. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He's clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he's called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, we're following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and in his, on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, Robe dipped in blood. Let me just go ahead and there's a lot to unpack, but robe dipped in blood real quickly might immediately rush to, well, he's the lamb of God. So sure, his robe is dipped in blood. That must be the blood of the cross, his sacrifice. Definitely relevant because it is no doubt, absolutely certain that Jesus is actually conquering death, hell, and the grave by the blood of the lamb. His sacrifice on the cross is what brings victory. No doubt about it. But Isaiah chapter 63, verses two and three, is a prophecy of this as well, speaking even of the wine press and, and how the garments were turned scarlet or red. And so Isaiah 63, two and three, is a prophecy that really declares that the blood on his robe could in fact not be just the blood of the lamb, the sacrifice of the cross, but because contextually he's not coming in peace, but he's coming as a conquering king of war, that this blood on his garment is actually the blood of his enemies, all right? And you're gonna understand why that's important 
in just a minute. And, and then the, the white robes, the, the, the white uh, linen garments of, of the armies that come with him, uh, first, because he's the, the lamb of God, shed his blood, well, that brings righteousness, so purity on the part of the army or those who are with him, the believers, those who follow him. Um, but then Isaiah 63, two and three, leads us to believe there's this contrast between the fact that we are not an army that fights. Look, the army that's coming with him in Revelation 19 is not an army that has swords, that does battle. While the blood is on the garments of the one who rides in front, that is Jesus, the conquering king, there's no blood on the garments of his army. Why? Because they didn't have to do the work. The work is all being done by Jesus. And it's super important because that's the way it is. You may be here and you may be like, well, hey, I think I'm saved. I think I'm a Christian. I've been working really hard. If that's your answer, save you some time. You're not a Christian. Because being a Christian is not about you working really hard. It's not about you trying to be good enough, man. I'm just telling you, and you just make, I hope it didn't confuse you that a pastor would say this. But if, if, as a pastor, if I was trying to measure up and I was trying to add up on a list, man, make a spreadsheet of all the reasons God should save me, there is nothing on my list worth saving. Right. Nothing. And if that's what you think, if you think, oh, I thought church was a bunch of people who thought they were good enough for God, you come to the wrong church, man, because this church is a group of people who recognize without God, we're nothing, man. We're, in, and we're inadequate. We're insufficient at best. There's nothing in me that deserves heaven aside from Jesus. And so that's the context that we understand. Look, we're not working for salvation. We're not working to try to prove to God that somehow we deserve to be saved. No, we come and if there's a war that's ever been fought, if there's a battle in our lives that ever needs to be fought, we fight, literally we sing a song about this. When we fight, we fight on our knees. Why? Because we recognize that Jesus is the one who's gotta win the war. Jesus is the one who's got to do the battle in our lives or we will fall every time. So real quickly, let me just do comparison to the, the two triumphal entries real quickly. The final triumphal entry was a whole lot different from the first one we found in John chapter 12. The first triumphal entry, the people prepared the path for the king. You remember, they threw down the palm branches in front of Jesus riding on this donkey. And, and the second time, however, the king will lead the way for the people. He will lead the way and the army will be behind him. The first time, John chapter 12, the sacrificial king is a lamb being led to slaughter the cross of Calvary, dying for you and for me. The second time, the resurrected king will be leading an army and he will be going to slaughter his enemies. And then Jesus will not be riding on a donkey the second time. He will be riding a white horse. Jesus will not be coming as a gracious king of peace. You may say, well, I, I don't know if I like that. He's not gonna come the second time as a gracious king of peace. Instead, he will come back as a conquering king of war. The first time Jesus came to offer salvation and peace with God. That offer is still extended to you today. This is the good news, it's not too late. But the second time Jesus is gonna come to judge those who have rejected him. And so here's the thing, some people may say, well I just don't, I don't like the white horse Jesus. I like the donkey Jesus better, you know what I'm saying? You ever seen Talladega Nights? I'm sorry if you think that's sacrilegious to say. But Talladega Nights, Will, as Will Ferrell, I think was praying and he's at the dinner table and he's like, dear eight pound, six ounce baby Jesus. And then they scold him and he says, oh, that's the Jesus I like to pray to, you know? If you don't think that's funny, you're, you're not a redneck. Anyway, anyway. <clears throat> so I, I do think though, we're, we're, we're dumb like that. We like, we compartmentalize things. We're like, well, I like this part of the Bible. I don't like this part of the Bible. You know, I like that John 12 Jesus riding in on the donkey. He just, that's so peaceful. And I love salvation and forgiveness and grace. I take that one, you know? But the Revelation 19, this whole blood dip robe, what's up with that? You know, I mean, he's coming to conquer, kill and destroy, judge. Woo, yeah. Let's, let's back up to John 12, Wayne. Tell us that story again. I think kind of we want to pick and choose which Jesus we believe in. Let me just tell you this, all right? And this is me and you both. I'm, I'm in the same category. It does not matter which Jesus I want. He's coming. He's coming. 
You, you don't have to believe in Revelation 19. I can't force you to. You don't have to believe he's going to come to judge and conquer. But he is coming anyway. And he will judge. And he will conquer. And so the whole idea of truth is that we can't skirt around it or tell less than the whole part of it. If I just give you some of it, if I just give you the triumphal entry in John 12, well, that's only part of the truth. Did he come in peace to bring salvation and grace? Yes, yes. And here's the great news. That invitation is still extended to you right now. But I want you to hear this. That invitation will not last forever. The invitation has limitation. There will come a day when there are no more days for you to surrender to Jesus. That's the most loving thing I can say to you. Is that there are coming days when there will be no more days. There will be a time where you, oh, I'm just going to put that off, man. One day I'm, I'm going to get right with Jesus. One day when I get a family and I have kids and I got a wife or a husband, I'm going to really settle down. I'm going to love Jesus then. You are not in charge of your days. And there's a limitation to his invitation. But here's the good news for you right now. You can still, by faith, receive the king of peace who brings salvation by grace. This is beautiful. So don't miss the first triumphal entry because we're looking ahead to the second. You have time today. So here's the bottom line. The humble savior is coming again as a conquering king. And so before we get into Revelation 20, I'm gonna generalize this because for the sake of time, I wanna allow time at the end of the service. This is one thing I'm doing different than I did the first two. I walked through three different views of millennial millennial kingdoms and all of that. When we read in chapter 20 in just a minute, we're going to be talking about the millennial kingdom. All right, Here's the, the generalization of, of what I've been explaining all morning. You can go back and watch the first two if you'd like to, to see what you're missing. All right, but Here's the generalization. There are people who view it as literal. There are people who view it as figurative. All right, There are people, and that, that really determines if you're pre-mill, if you're uh, post-mill, or if you're amillennial. A mill means millennial. And so you may be like, what in the world's that? Well, chapter 20 determines a lot in the sense that what you think about the millennial kingdom determines where you are in relationship to eschatology or the end times. And while that's super important, I think, I think your salvation is more important than diving deeper into that right now. And so I feel like this is super, God just lead me a different direction. So here's what you need to hear. No matter if that's figurative, what we're about to read, no matter if it's literal, thousand year kingdom, Jesus on earth, or if this is a figurative understanding in a more amillennial perspective, regardless, there are three things that you need to know for sure. And we're gonna to get to those three things after we read Revelation chapter 20. And look with me at verse one, and we're gonna see the explanation of the thousand year reign. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and the great chain. And he seized the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, bound him for a thousand years and threw him in the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. And that he must be released for a little while. Your translation may say a little season. Then I saw thrones and seated on those thrones were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God and those who had not worshiped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or on their hands. They came to life, literally back to life and reigned with Jesus for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years had ended. And this is the first resurrection, blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Why? Because they were Christians. They were believers. Uh, and, and so over such, the second death had no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. And again, regardless of your interpretation of what that means, figurative or literal, we've been making the primary purpose of our study 
finding the main things and, and believing together that the main things are the plain things in Revelation. The plain things are the main things. And so with that as our backdrop, I wanna give you three certain things that we know based on the reading so far. First, we see the resurrected king will come for his eternal kingdom. There is an eternal kingdom. Now you may say, wait a minute, I thought the kingdom was a thousand years. It's a thousand year millennial reign. Regardless if this chapter 20 is talking about a literal thousand years or a figurative thousand years, there is a literal kingdom of God that's not a figment of our imagination or a fictitious idea or a figurative explanation or illustration. And this kingdom of God that is literal is not just a thousand years long, it is an eternal kingdom, regardless of what else you believe. And when that kingdom begins, which ultimately has already begun, it will be a kingdom that lasts forever more. Psalm chapter 145, verse 13. If you, if you wanna take these references down, I don't think they're gonna be on the screen because of uh, the nature of the message today. Psalm 145, 13 says, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. And then in Luke chapter one, verse 32, in the birth of Jesus, this is when the angel comes to Virgin Mary The angel appears to Mary and says, he will be great, speaking of Jesus, and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. And so the kingdom of God is forevermore. It is is not a temporary kingdom. Then Luke chapter 17, verse 21, basically teaches us that Jesus is the kingdom of God in many ways. Jesus taught us about the kingdom of God, taught an awful lot about the kingdom of God through parables, but we do know that in many ways, wherever Jesus is, the kingdom is. It's kind of like, what do you think about home? Like, where, where is home? Well, Wayne, everybody knows home is where the heart is, amen? You know, ain't that in the Bible? That's somewhere in the Bible, right? Um, uh, home, home, I would say home is where, uh, generally, home is where family is. If you were to say, where's your home? Well, our home is Rockmark, Georgia. I was born, born in Dothan, Alabama. But then two years old, I moved to Georgia. And uh, my mom and daddy were from Rockmark, Georgia. And so they graduated from Rockmark High School, Amy graduated from Rockmart High School. I graduated from Rockmart High School. We're just a bunch of Rockmart people. So my family, Amy's mom and daddy, my mom and daddy, my sisters, all of them still live in Rockmart. So that's home. Why is that home? It's really not because I grew up there. It's really because that's where my family is. In the same way though, more, more so, home is wherever Amy is. Home is where my kids are. And so Simpsonville, if somebody's going, where's home? Well, Simpsonville's home. Why is that? Because that's where Amy is. <laughs> I've said before, if she ever leaves me, I'm going with her. Amen. You know, if, if you feel that way? I mean, why? Because that's, that's home, man. What are you talking about? That's home. That's happiness. That's health. That's my brain. I, I wouldn't even know what to do. Where would I, how would I tie on my shoes? I don't even know what I'd eat tomorrow. But anyway, so, so home is where Amy is. The kingdom of God is where Jesus is. If Jesus is there, it's home. If Jesus is there, it's heaven. If Jesus is there, it truly is the kingdom of God. And so likewise, so the eternal kingdom of God is wherever Jesus is. So the eternal kingdom will be a place we celebrate eternal victory that comes from the conquering king. And so in chapter 20, verses seven through 10, we see this eternal victory this final battle to end all battles. This is not Armageddon, this is actually after Armageddon. This is the, the final battle uh, where the, the, the enemy's released for a little season, if you will. This is a picture really of the final enemy's rebellion. And regardless of your timeline and the specifics of your beliefs about Revelation chapter 20, this is what we know for sure. Though Jesus rode a donkey into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, bringing peace to all of us, chapter 19 shows us that Jesus will, on the second triumphal entry, ride in on a white horse and establish his eternal victory. It won't just be a peace that he brings, 
it will actually be an end to everything bad. And just so that anybody were, you know, were to try to pick and choose which Jesus you like best, the Jesus who comes back uh, on the second triumphal entry, riding on a white horse, the conquering king, is actually gonna put an end to all things that are bad. This is, this is the, the king that's gonna put a, an end to death. This is the king that's gonna put an end to, to sickness, to pain, to sin, to temptation. Jesus is going to end it all. It's like he's, he's in heaven, he's like, enough, enough. I've let them wonder long enough. I've let them struggle long enough. I, it's, it's done, it's done. I'm gonna put an end to it once and for all. But the, the consequences of that event are what we've got to lean in on and listen to. Look at verse 10. This is actually high five verse right here. Verse 10, the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire. Man, that makes me want to shout. I'm just so grateful. I can't wait until the enemy once and for all is going to be thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. That is what they deserve. This is the devil. This is the antichrist. This is the false prophet. And so Lucifer rebelled. If you think back a few weeks, again, if this is your first Sunday, did I mention every week's not exactly like this, all right? But, but if you were here earlier, you, you remember that in, in Revelation we've been walking through, we talked about even how uh, Lucifer was cast out of heaven uh, with a third of the angels that are now demons, they all rejected God. And, uh, and, and so uh, they, have, they have rebelled against God thousands of years ago now. And, uh, and he's been wreaking havoc. The enemy has been wreaking havoc on the human race ever since. I mean, like literally, there's not a man in this room, a boy, a, a woman or a girl in this room who have not faced daily complications and struggles based on the battle that we're in, the spiritual war, Ephesians chapter six, look it up. Ephesians chapter six talks about this spiritual warfare that we're in, and this is a battle that we know all too well. So with that as the backdrop, I want you to grab a hold of this because this is personal. Listen, the victory that we see in verse 10 when the devil is thrown where he belongs, this is not just victory for Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus, this is personal. This is personal. We're in this fight every day, man. We're, we're constantly kicked when we're down. We're constantly pushed down. We constantly hear the, the whispers of the liar in our ear. He's not our friend. He's been your enemy since the day you were born. And so when Jesus finally cast him into the bottomless pit, listen, this is victory for you too, man. This is your victory. This is, this is the day that you win, not because of how good you are, or how hard you worked, but because you named the name of Jesus, ultimately because your name is written down in the Lamb's book of life. That's where we'll get in just a minute. So this victory is, is your victory if you're a Christian. Now again, if you're not a Christian, stark contrast that we're gonna see even now because it's not just about an eternal kingdom. It's not just about an eternal victory that Jesus has won, but an eternal kingdom must have an eternal king and that king sits on eternal throne. So that's the third thing we see is an eternal throne. Look at chapter 20, Revelation chapter 20. Look at verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who seated on it from his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. I want you to understand the whole imagery here of the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. That's you. That's, that's, that, that is everyone. No matter how much money you have, no matter how poor you are, no matter what status you held, standing before the throne, another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead 
who were in it, death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Now, I want you to understand that if you, if you don't know Jesus, your eternal condition will depend on what you have done. That's it. Like, like you're, God letting you in heaven or, or not is going to be determined by what you've done. If you're not a believer, if you're an unbeliever, if you're not a Christian, if you're not following Jesus, it is going to be all about what you did. It said, I want you to know, I don't want that. I don't want that. Because there's no amount of good. There's no amount of good that you could do that would deserve to go to heaven. There's no amount of good that I could do that would make me deserve to go to heaven. And so it really, it's a perplexing thing. I mean, I, who, who wants our deeds to determine where we go? Every religion in the world, aside from true Christianity, believes there's a scale. And if you answer it this way, listen, I want you to understand, you're not a follower of Jesus. Not, you don't understand the gospel. If you would say that, well, I hope when I get to heaven that I've just done more good than bad. I hope the good stuff outweighs the bad stuff and God will say, hey, you made it. If that's your definition of salvation, you don't get the gospel. Because the gospel is not about you going to heaven because of what you have done. You don't want to be judged eternally based on what you've done. Why? You're going to see in a second. It says in verse 16 of chapter 19, just to remind you. On the robe of Christ, his name was written, King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the King of kings. As King of kings sitting on his eternal throne of his eternal kingdom, Jesus will execute eternal judgment, but he will also grant eternal life. I want you to look at chapter 20, verse 15. And I want you to look at it and lean into it. I don't want you to run from it. I don't want you to put your fingers in your ears. I want you to hear this. As believers, you need to hear this. You need to hear this, that your family and your friends who don't know Jesus, we're about to read about them in verse 15. If you're a Christian, your neighbors and your, the student that sits across the aisle from you in math class, that's not a believer, not a follower of Jesus, they're in verse 15. But if you're here and you don't know if you're a Christian, you're like, I don't know. You're in verse 15 if you don't know Jesus. If anyone's name is not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. I want you to hear this, man. When, when the devil's thrown into the lake of fire, I want to celebrate. Antichrist, false prophet. We, we can actually find victory in that. I want you to understand there is no... There is no man or woman on this planet that I want to see cast into the lake of fire. I don't want anybody to go to hell. I don't want any neighbor that I have to miss heaven. Why are we so passionate about evangelism and reaching people in the upstate? Because we can't imagine that anybody that we know would be in verse 15 because of our lack of concern and passion for the gospel. Look, we can't save everybody. We can't save anybody without Jesus. But I, I guarantee you, as much as depends on us, we want to tell everyone while we can about the grace that's offered. Because here's the beautiful thing. The King of Peace is still offering salvation. He's still inviting you to be saved. You may say, well, I, just, I just don't like this whole judgment. Then get saved. Make a decision. I just want to wait until... Don't wait till later. God forbid, man. What are you waiting? Why would you roll the dice on your life? Why would you take a chance? Give your life to Jesus. Be a man. Be a woman of God. And say yes to him. Not yes with these stipulations. Not yes with these conditions. Just surrender to the king. He's the king. You are not the king of your life. 
Let him be king. Let him rule. Let him sit on the throne of your life. Because here's the truth. If you don't bow today, you will bow one day. I am going to bow. We're all going to bow. At the name of Jesus, every knee is going to bow. We all call the events of John 12 the triumphal entry. Where King Jesus rode into Jerusalem with peace and salvation. The Lamb of God going to the cross to die for our sins. But in Revelation 19, we see the King riding in again. But he's not riding on a donkey this time. He's riding on a white horse. And he's not bringing peace. He's bringing judgment. Here's the good news. If your name is written in the book, he is bringing victory for you. Eternal victory for you. So the most important question of your life, it's not the most important question of Palm Sunday in 2024. It's not the most important question of the year. This is more important than anything you ever hear in your life, man. Don't miss it. Listen, here's the question. Is your name in the book? Is your name in the book? I'm not saying, are you a member of the church? There's a lot of members of the church that are going to go to hell. How is that possible? Because he doesn't say every name written down on First Baptist Church roll goes to heaven. The Lamb's book of life. Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? Have you surrendered your life to Jesus? Are you a follower of Jesus? Are you unashamed of Jesus? Man, if you've never been saved, I can't imagine you'd leave this place without knowing for sure. But then today, I mean, the altar ought to be filled with believers, just to be honest, who care about lost people. Who want to say, God, forgive me for not telling my friend about Jesus. God, forgive me. We ought not have an invite card to Easter left. Man, we ought to take everybody, we ought to tell everybody we can. Man, come sit with me. Because I can't imagine them being in verse 15. God, help us. Lord, would you speak to us, God, today? God, would you do for us what we can't do for ourselves? Lord, I know that my words are insufficient, God, that so many times I wish that I could, I wish that I could even make people do the right thing. We can't, God. I know that without the power of your spirit, without the conviction even of your spirit even now, there's no decision they can make that would be true. So, Lord, I pray for what I can't do myself. Lord, I pray would you speak to the hearts of men, women, boys, and girls. Those who need Jesus, I pray they would not wait, but they would be saved. They would make the decision to follow you. And they would want to tell everybody, God help them. Then I pray that Christians would actually wake up to a world that's going to end. God help us wake up to lost souls all around us. Help us see the world through your eyes. And I pray that we would not get rest until we've told everyone about your grace. It's still available, God. Would you save people? We pray in Jesus' name. Let's stand together.